Hi everyone, I'm Marisol Nichols. Now you may know me as an actress from film and television. What you may not know is that I have been working in the anti-trafficking movement for over a decade. I've been honored to work alongside law enforcement as an undercover operative, both in the US and abroad, to help put bad guys in jail and help rescue some women and children. I created my foundation for a slavery-free world and this podcast to help prevent you or your loved ones from ever falling prey to these predators. Thank you, and welcome to the Marisol Nichols Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Marisol Nichols Podcast. My guest today, I have been trying to get on since our first season. I'm so excited. Her name is Yasmin Vafa. She's the founder and co-executive director for Rights for Girls, which is a phenomenal organization. And I met Yasmin maybe, she's 12 years ago, I think, um, when she was working on and blowing open the No Such Thing, No Such Thing as a Child Prostitute campaign that changed sort of everything in the anti-trafficking world and changed how the media refers to children. Um, and Yasmin, if you can talk a little bit about that, I know that's not what we're going to completely go into today, but I, I do want my audience to know how groundbreaking that was. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me yeah. on. And it's so great to see you again. Um, so yeah, the No Such Thing campaign. Well, we were so honored to partner with a young child sex trafficking survivor, T. Ortiz, who is just a powerhouse. And she was a young woman who basically was born into the foster care system in California. And from a young age was trafficked all around the West Coast of the United States. And with working with her and so many other young survivors of domestic child sex trafficking, we were confronted with the injustice of these child victims who were often too young to even be consenting to sex, but who had been criminalized and often incarcerated for prostitution offenses all throughout the United States. Uh, and this was true despite the fact that we have federal and state laws that recognize these child victims as victims of human trafficking. And so so together, we partnered to launch this campaign to not only change our language uh, and the stigmatizing way that we talk about these children as child prostitutes, yeah. as um, child sex workers, uh, but also to change our laws. And so, you know, since that campaign, which we launched in 2015, we have changed a number of state laws to basically end the criminalization of child victims and instead route these children into protective services, give them support and offer them healing instead of basically punishing them for what amounts to child abuse. Um, you know, at the time we said this was one of the only forms of child abuse where our response was to criminalize the abused child. And so um, we've had a lot of success with that campaign. We continue to call out the media when they get it wrong and, you know, call these kids child or teen sex workers um, mm -hmm. and blame them and assign them agency when none exists. But um, yeah, we, we continue to really promote uh, the concept of no such thing. Thank you so much for everything that you do. Your, your organization is just so incredible what you've accomplished and, and the data that you put out there as far as like the sexual abuse to prison pipeline, like it's a, it's literally a pipeline. And the, you know, the fact that African American and Hispanic girls are more likely to go to prison than any other than white girls, just to be honest. And you have so many statistics on there and so many amazing studies that you've done. Um, I really want to get into the core of what we're talking about, but if you don't mind just touching a little bit on the other work that you do with gender-based violence and all of that, I, th I think it'd be really great for my audience to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we began to see, and honestly, it's what brought us to the issue of child sex trafficking, was we were working with girls all across the country um, and through our partnerships with direct service providers across the country. And we began to hear this common narrative of girls who had experienced violence, um, you know, sexual abuse, family violence. And, you know, one after the other, we began to realize that these girls had all been criminal 
criminalized and they had spent time in the juvenile justice system. And we began to wonder whether this was, you know, um, something that was happening in a few jurisdictions or whether it was a pattern. And what we began to realize is that it was, in fact, a pattern, and especially for girls of color. And so we set out and we wrote this report called The Sexual Abuse to Prison Pipeline, The Girl's Story. And in it, we highlighted the experiences of African-American, Latina, and Native American girls. Um, And we found that when these marginalized girls experience gender-based violence, because to be clear, um, gender-based violence amongst girls is pervasive. And the CDC just released their most recent data on Mm. how pervasive violence against girls in this country is. But when girls with economic and family stability experience abuse, they often are in a better position to be able to access the services and support to be able to get on a path to healing. But when these marginalized girls experience abuse, they too often are forced to take their safety into their own hands. And too often our system punishes them for those acts. So for the young girl in foster care who is being sexually abused, who runs away to escape that violence, she is arrested for the status offense of running away. Uh, For the young girl who is being sexually harassed or uh, abused at school, she can be arrested for truancy uh, and for the child sex trafficking victim um, who is arrested for prostitution. And so we really wanted to map this pipeline uh, to give it a name and to really highlight that for girls and girls of color, the pathway into prison was very different than it was for boys. And so we really wanted to call attention to this. And, you know, in all of the great justice reform work that was happening, No one was really highlighting what it looked like for girls and for girls of color and ultimately for women in the prison system. Because what happens is when you don't provide these services and support, these girls grow up and it fuels a a vicious cycle of victimization and ultimately adult incarceration. And we actually have an update to the report that should be released in the coming weeks um, called Criminalized Survivors, the Today's Abuse to Prison Pipeline for Girls. And we really wanted to re-examine, yeah, re-examine this issue in the wake of, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, and the pandemic. So that'll be coming out soon to really look great. at where we are today. For my audience, by the way, who's only listening to this, Yasmin is also beautiful. Like, this is a <laughs> gorgeous girl, just so everyone knows. Um, we're about to get into a bit of a other subject that we've actually never covered on the podcast. But just so my audience is aware, she's also an award-winning human rights lawyer and advocate, and she currently serves on the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Advisory Committee on the Sex Trafficking of Children and Youth. Yasmin is very, very much an expert in this field. Okay, so here we go. The big... (laughs) Dirty sort of word and dirty part of working in the anti-trafficking movement is all of these groups that are out there talking about sort of sex workers' rights and trying to essentially legalize or decriminalize uh, what they now call as sex work. Right. And it's a big thing because um, I remember when I was in D.C. and walking around and meeting with different legislators when we were talking about back, back page. Right. right behind us were all the sex workers groups. Mm-hmm. They are heavily funded. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's another subject. So to sort of dive into this, because I don't think most of my audience understands that there are actually bills and laws being pushed through mm-hmm. to essentially legalize this field and the damaging consequences that would happen once you do legalize this. So Yasmin was just literally in Vermont talking about mm-hmm. a Senate bill there that was literally, well, I'm, I'm going to let you, why don't you just like explode that bomb right now? Tell me about <laughs> this bill and go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, this is just one of many bills that have been introduced in the last couple of years, but you know, what I think is important for, for listeners to recognize is you know, we've been hearing this common phrase, you know, sex work is work and decriminalize sex work. And I think, you know, a lot of really well-intentioned people think that these efforts are 
to support, you know, sex workers or the most marginalized people in the sex industry. Um, and while they may some of some of these efforts might be well intentioned, what people don't realize is that what these efforts actually entail is a full scale decriminalization of the entire industry. And so when you look at these bills, when you look at what these proposals actually entail, what they actually do is to repeal all of the laws against pimping, brothels, and sex buying, um, which the combination of which actually hugely expands the sex industry and actually have been shown to increase sex trafficking. And we can talk about exactly what why that is. But yep. I think what's really frightening is in the last few years, we've seen bills introduced in Oregon, in uh, Louisiana, in D.C., in New York, in Massachusetts, Vermont. You know, I just came back from Vermont with survivors who were very concerned um, you know, it's happening everywhere. And even where there's not bills introduced, there's, you know, district attorneys and prosecutors who are just refusing to enforce the laws. You know, they're just basically saying, oh, you know, this is, you know, consenting adults and we're just not going to enforce it anymore. Um, that's happened in a few places in New York City. And, you know, we work with Covenant House in New York, for example, and they said that they have seen a huge uptick in traffickers recruiting young people outside of their program. Um, it's just skyrocketed. Um, and, and in places like California, for example, where they've seen uh, lax laws, um, mm -hmm. some repeals of loitering laws, for example, which we would normally support, but without services, without uh, the enforcement of, you know, prohibitions against sex buying, we are now seeing uh, a huge uptick in the number of exploited women and girls. And it's just a huge problem. We're seeing increases in gun violence, increases in um, organized crime and the other types of collateral crimes that accompany prostitution. It's not like, you know, marijuana. People always compare the two. This is about human beings uh, and the collateral crimes associated with prostitution are very, very different. You know, we're talking about rape, sexual violence, organized criminal activity, gang violence, um, gun violence. It's very serious. And so uh, it's concerning to see all of these bills popping up under the guise of being very progressive when in fact uh, they, you know, have been shown to be incredibly harmful and violent and, you know, racist in many ways uh, in terms of the outcomes uh, of who's disproportionately harmed and who's disproportionately impacted. Uh, so, yeah, it's very, very concerning. Thank you for, for spelling all of that out. And I think to sort of bring it back a little bit there, this has been shown in history. Yeah. As far as when you legalize something like this, like in Nevada or Amsterdam, mm -hmm. because I can hear the audience going, well, what's the problem? I mean, if you just legalize it, then it's not going to be a problem. So I I really if you can spell that. Yes. out Of like like actual facts. This is not opinion here. Go ahead, yeah. please. So what people don't understand about sex trafficking and prostitution, and, and, and I will say in recent years, we hear people saying, well, you're conflating the two, you're conflating sex trafficking and sex work, you're conflating them. And we recognize that these are two legally distinct issues, but people need to start understanding that they're inextricably linked. Um, first of all, the majority of the adults in the sex industry were first entering the sex industry when they were minors. That's just a reality. Um, you know, what we always say is that they're the child sex trafficking victims of yesterday. Right. So when these individuals turn 18, does it all of a sudden become an empowered career choice? You know, that's a complicated question. When somebody entered at 13 or 14 years old, does it all of a sudden become their choice? Does it become a, a decision of agency? I, you know, I, I would really question that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, secondly, the sex buyers who are soliciting these individuals can't tell who, if the person they're soliciting is there by choice or not. And frankly, from what we hear from survivors, they don't really care. Uh, right. You can go on these John boards, these review boards, which, you know, your listeners probably don't even know exist. Mm -hmm. But think of Yelp for prostitution. There are these online review boards that sex buyers go on in every single city and they review the the women and girls that they purchase in the most graphic terms 
Um, you know, the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, Cat W, just put out this very, you know, phenomenal report on New York State sex buyers all across New York State. And exactly what they say about these women. In many cases, they know that they're not there by choice. They know that they're underage uh, and and just very demeaning ways that they talk about these individuals that they're purchasing. And, you know, the other way that these two issues are connected is that the policies that are designed to govern one inevitably impact the other. So these are happening in the same ecosystem. We can't pretend as if you know, they're two separate things. Um, You know, put another way, sex trafficking might be the means, but prostitution is the ultimate end. And so it's important to realize the ways these issues are connected. And so, you know, the other important concept for folks to realize is that sex trafficking exists in our society today because the demand for commercial sex already outpaces the supply. And that means that even though it's illegal to buy sex virtually everywhere in Mm -hmm. the United States today, there are enough men willing to break the law to buy sex that there just aren't enough willing, consenting people to supply that for them. And that's why traffickers have to resort to, you know, manipulating, coercing, luring vulnerable people to meet that demand. So if we were to suddenly implement these these laws, these proposed laws that seek to legalize or decriminalize sex buying, how many more men would enter this market as new clients? Mm -hmm. The demand would spike even higher than it already is. And, you know, through sex tourism, it's what we see in Amsterdam. It's what we see in the brothels in Nevada, uh, places like Germany that have a legalized sex trade. They have 1.2 million sex buyers per day. You know, who who would be making up that gap? Right. Would it be, you know, women with PhDs? <laughs> I don't think so. Right. It would be mm-hmm. marginalized people. And oftentimes it's children. It's youth. Uh, The sex trade really relies on a steady stream of youth, marginalized kids, you know, foster kids, runaway and homeless youth, abused children who, uh, you know, they know that once these kids are in the sex industry, they're often there for many, many years. Um, They're easier to lure. They're easier to manipulate. Oftentimes, sex buyers are demanding younger and younger girls. You know, if you go on Pornhub and you look at their, you know, (laughs) annual highest terms, the the most, you know, search terms on there each year, they put out their most search terms, teen and teenager and school girls, those types of terms are very commonly searched. And so that's who is going to make up that gap. And so it's very important for people to understand these laws are going to impact the sex trafficking issue and going to drive up that demand for commercial sex even higher. Um, and we know this. We're not speculating. We saw what happened in Germany. We saw what happened in the Netherlands. And we see what's happening in New Zealand. Uh, and it's disproportionately indigenous Maori women and girls who are being trafficked there. And unfortunately, because of their full decriminalization policies, um, the United States, you know, that tip report that they put out every year, they've lowered the ranking of New Zealand the last couple of years. They have basically said New Zealand does not meet their minimum requirements uh, when it comes to trafficking. They haven't initiated or prosecuted a single sex trafficker in the last couple of years, nor have they identified a single sex trafficking victim in the entire Mm -hmm. country. So... I don't know why we're trying to replicate a failed policy. Um, You know, I think people need to realize the sex industry is a multi-billion dollar industry like Mm -hmm. tobacco, like tech, you know, and they have an interest. This is about big business. And I think people forget that. I think they do, too. And I I love that you brought up that that specific example of New New Zealand. How Mm -hmm. because because I think, you know, when people don't really understand this issue, it's very easy I've heard people that in their just, you know, innocence and ignorance, they're like, well, what could it hurt? And I think that that thing that you brought up in New Zealand is a great example. If you legalize uh, and decriminalize the sex industry, what choice, who is going in to look for the kids and the women that are being held against their will? Exactly. It's perfectly illegal. It's perfectly legal. Excuse me. So. Why would any policeman, FBI, government agency, military go in there and look for anyone being held against their will? Because it's perfectly legal. You can't prove it. Now there's no cause. 
And I don't think they exactly. understand. I don't think people understand that. And the victims of this billion dollar sex industry are ultimately children. Exactly. Was, you know, I was shocked to read about um, Amnesty International. <laughs> Like people were shocked when I told them this, that Amnesty International changed their tune mm -hmm. and completely are jumping aboard this movement to decriminalize the sex industry. And I was shocked, by the way, people, you can check this out for yourself. Just go on amnestyinternational.org mm -hmm. and read about it yourself. It's a whole giant, you know, PDF file on there. And they talk about these pimps instead of the word pimp. You know, because that that's yeah. not good. Let's call them sex facilitators. Yeah, or managers. Now, that's another managers. one. Managers. Now, the yeah. last I checked, I don't need a, 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 why would I need a man mm -hmm. to tell me who I can and cannot sleep with, right? Mm -hmm. That alone puts this in a whole different realm where all you're essentially doing are, is legalizing trafficking. Right. You're literally giving the men who control these women and kids the pure right to do this. And you're not giving and, law enforcement any tools to go in there to help anyone who, God forbid, you know, is not there willingly. Well, and that's what's say. so fascinating. No, it's what's so fascinating. Um, it's, it's really interesting because that's what happens. It blurs the line between yes. a manager and a trafficker. And that's why in those countries, they've had such a difficult time prosecuting traffickers. Uh, and, you know, we, we hear this all the time um, in Vermont, for example, they will say, well, we still have the trafficking laws. Like we agree with you. Trafficking is abhorrent. We, we also think trafficking is bad. We're keeping all the trafficking laws. We're just getting rid of all of these pimping statutes because sometimes someone needs a manager or, you know, this or that. They need people to a bodyguard or somebody to drive them or this and that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but what people don't realize is exactly what you were saying. These often function as lesser penalties for trafficking when people don't understand is that trafficking prosecutions are very difficult to bring because they often rely on victim testimony. And these survivors are scared. Uh, oftentimes they run, they are too frightened to confront their traffickers in court. We often can't get survivors to come and do meetings or like openly speak about their experiences because they're too frightened and there's too many safety concerns and it's traumatic, uh, much less go to open court and testify against their trafficker. So it's difficult to bring these prosecutions and often prosecutors rely on these pimping and, and procurement statutes in order to have these traffickers plead down. Um, so, you know, what we often compare it to is it would be like repealing, you know, second degree murder, manslaughter, involuntary manslaughter and being like, but don't worry, we still have murder one. You know, at, at the same time that you're expanding the industry and inviting all, more exploitation and more exploiters to the market, it's completely nonsensical and it's a disingenuine argument to say, well, we still have the trafficking statute. Don't worry. You're repealing all of these lesser penalties and it's incredibly harmful and damaging. So, you know, and, and you mentioned another critical point about removing probable cause um, in New Zealand. The Ministry of Justice did their own report and said exactly that, that law enforcement now lacks probable cause to enter these suspected sites of child exploitation because it's legal. It's effectively legal. And so even though they they might suspect that kids are being exploited inside these residential brothels and informal brothels, they can't go inside. They can't go inside and, and find these kids. That's it's such a huge point. And, and most people don't understand that. So I'm, I'm so glad that you you expounded on that. Mm -hmm. I also heard that Amsterdam, I, th I think you said Amsterdam is mm -hmm. considering repealing their law. So is that correct? Yeah. Well, so they, I think everyone has basically realized that legalization in particular is a big failure, right? So Amsterdam and, you know, Germany, they've realized there's a huge trafficking problem, huge organized crime. Uh, and Amsterdam, the government of the Netherlands has actually invested millions in this new campaign that, you know, has actually been all over the news lately to um, do outreach to, you know, basically bachelor parties and people who are online basically trying to book a bachelor party to the Netherlands and to Amsterdam, a warning basically comes up and tries to deter mm. them from coming to the to the red light district because they've had such problems with 
basically the type of men who are sex buyers, right? The type of men who would want to come and engage in that type of behavior. It turns out they're not really the type of men you want to have as tourists. Sex tourists are not the type of men you want to invite to your country and to have around your people. Turns out, you know, they're sexually coercive men (laughs) that people don't want around. And, you know, they're now forced to spend millions of dollars to invest in this type of campaign to deter that type of tourism and to think, think what type of country would be actively spending millions of dollars to detour tourism. You know, that's how destructive these tourists are that they're actually spending money to deter them. So I think that speaks volumes. Um, And Germany, similarly, I think they're having a huge trafficking problem. But what becomes difficult for the state to divest from this type of scheme is that they start making money as, as, you know, revenue from, from a legalization scheme. And so it becomes difficult to divest once you legalize prostitution and start making tax money. Um, you know, and some of the other arguments that we've heard over the years are, you know, it reduces stigma and the women will, you know, become yes. empowered sex workers. Well, Germany has had this law for over 20 years. And I think, you know, a handful of women have registered as quote unquote sex workers. It's, it's done nothing, you know, right. of the sort. And if anything, dozens of women have been killed inside the brothels in Germany, where they have 12 story brothels in places like Cologne. Um, you know, Berlin alone has over 500 brothels. It, it's just, is that the type of society it, we want to emulate? Um, you know, similarly, or by contrast, Sweden, which, you know, uh, adopted their model, which is a partial decriminalization approach, which decriminalizes and recognizes the people um, in prostitution as victims of gender based violence, offers them support to get out of the industry, gives them, you know, supportive services and exit support. Um, while maintaining criminal penalties against buyers, pimps, and brothels, they have basically been declared a dead zone by Europol for trafficking because the demand is so low. Uh, So traffickers don't even bother going there. Mm -hmm. So I think we have two examples, one country that adopted this partial decriminalization model and the other that adopted legalization. So I think that's really good evidence for, you know, what, what works and what doesn't. I think that's vital. And those are two countries that we can look to and just look at, okay, well, what are the results of these laws? Right. And then what are the results of the partial decriminalization and giving women an opportunity, as you mentioned, to get out and an exit strategy. Because because as you pointed out, these other laws that are going on in Vermont and California uh, don't help women. (laughs) They literally help the buyers. They help the men the pimps and they help the buyers and that's it. Um, you know, there was a recent law, which I, guys, I cannot make this up. So this loitering law was put through by, is it Senator or Congressman Wiener? I forget. I forget if he's like an assembly member or Senator. I forget. Yeah. So in California, there was a law that was put through and championed by Scott Wiener. So he's introduced this law and it went through in California, which essentially um, allows in the past, if a prostitute or a sex worker, depending on how you want to word it, was on the corner loitering for sex, the police could come in and be like, hey, let's move it along. You can't do that. That's legal. And this law went through where it's perfectly legal and it's not a problem. And the results of this in California have been slightly disastrous. Um, And you sent me some articles last night that I read that I was just like, right, of course. But can you talk about that um, for anyone listening so that they can actually understand? Because I really like the fact that we're showing cause and effect in this situation. So So please. So, you know, and, and loitering laws can be complicated because in many cases they are, you know, disproportionately used to criminalize the women and, and survivors. Um, but in this case, you know, there was no service component. There was no like diversion into services. There was no, um, you know, there was no other element other than just basically um, decriminalization. And and the law enforcement has basically 
interpreted it as full decriminalization. So they're no longer holding accountable buyers. They're no longer holding accountable exploiters and traffickers. And, you know, you can actually go on social media and see the reaction of many of the exploiters who are basically like, you know, the streets are ours and they are really expanding oh, um, the the exploitation of women and girls. And now it's happening much more openly um, law enforcement is basically ignoring the issue. And from the service providers that we work with, we are seeing and they are reporting a huge increase in the number of exploited uh, women and youth, uh, both in Los Angeles and in the Bay Area, um, uh, especially out in the open on like what they call the track or the blade. Um, and there's been a number of articles that have talked about just the degree of violence and exploitation that people are openly witnessing, um, that this is happening outside of schools, you know, that yeah. people will be, you know, walking down the street, seeing, you know, young women being physically assaulted by their exploiters. Um, there's gun violence happening in conjunction with this. And I think people are just not realizing like this is what this is a very accurate and, and foreshadowing and precursor. What's shocking is that, you know, places like San Francisco are now considering full decriminalization. Right. They're seeing this and they're saying, let's go all the way. Um, so that is what I think is incredibly shocking. And, and they want to create like zones for prostitution legalization. And again, you know, what community do you think they're going to set up those zones? Do you think they're going to set them up in the most affluent parts of San Francisco? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that you're going to, they're going to put them in, you know, some of the more marginalized communities? And once again, it's just, it's, it's very, you know, appalling. It, it's just, again, it, it disproportionately impacting marginalized communities who already know what this looks like, who already know who it's impacting and who don't mm -hmm. want this. If you talk to those communities, they know who's who's being impacted. They know who the buyers are. They know who's being exploited and they know who the children who are being exploited are. You know, when this came to D.C., it was very similar. Uh, the young people who were being trafficked talked about, you know, men from Virginia and Maryland coming in with those, you know, with license plates from out of town coming into, you know, the most um, Ward 7 and 8 in, in D.C., which were some of the, you know, more marginalized parts of our city, soliciting these young girls, even when they were in their school uniforms, you know, right. the entitlement that these men had. And I think it's very similar. So it's just fascinating to me that you can be witnessing this and the devastation and, and harm it's causing certain communities and still be promoting this policy. I think it, it's very telling mm -hmm. that this, this is what you're going to fight for mm -hmm. with all the problems that we have going on right now. This is what you're fighting for. It's shocking to me, and it and it's not shock. And and then at the same time, it's not shocking because they know what they're doing. It's just a free. Yeah. It's a free ride, and the victims are are you know you know this from going in and meeting. They don't want to hear from victims. They've got right. their mind made up. They want to be able to buy sex from any age, and it's perfectly fine. And if I'm a trafficker, let's let's just put you know just to spell it out in very raw terms. If I'm a trafficker. And I've got a 12, 13 year old girl or a bunch of them. Where am I going to go? I'm going to take those girls and I'm going to go to wherever it's legal because I'm never going to get caught because no policeman has any right to arrest me or even look into the ages of the girls because it's perfectly legal. And that's what we are setting the bad guys up with. And the fact that we have politicians that are fighting for this mm -hmm. and that are not listening to what the you know service provider organizations are saying or what the survivors are saying is not so much shocking as it is heartbreaking. Um, there was one thing that you said in a radio interview um, that you sent me, which I really liked and it gave me a lot of hope and I always like to end things on hope. And you said that when you did and were able to open doors in DC and in Vermont and in states and state legislator, and you were able to talk about the actual, you know, results of these laws that the people that you met with were shocked and that they were well-intentioned and they just didn't know. 
Can you just talk a little bit more about that? Because it really does give hope and it really does show what these guys are sort of trying to get away with. Please. I, I will say, yes. So in some cases, these laws are written by, you know, a handful of lobbyists um, who just, you know, mass produced these bills and shopped them out, you know, and, and have, you know, people introduce them. Uh, and so in many cases, when we have done meetings with legislators, they are absolutely shocked to find that the bills repeal all of the provisions against pimping and brothels and, you know, sex buying, they have no idea. And I will say, you know, in Vermont, we met with co-sponsors of the bill that had no idea that happened in DC too. They were shocked. They were like, what do you mean it repeals? You know, what do you mean it decriminalizes pimping? They had no idea. And in many cases, you know, they don't even want to take our word for it that, you know, they'll say like, okay, you're a lawyer, but you're a nonprofit lawyer. They don't believe you. So We've had to sometimes take the extra step of getting a legal memo from a big firm so that, you know, they'll have an extra stamp so they can, you know, feel comforted that someone else with a big law firm stamp is is backing up our legal analysis if, you know, they they don't want to take our word for it. But um, in some cases, they do. They know exactly what they're doing and they just truly believe that you know, this is an issue of consenting adults and they don't understand that children get caught up in this no matter what. Um, But it was heartening to see that, you know, so many individuals, once you, you know, pulled out the legislation and pulled out the legal analysis and said, you are repealing all of these prohibitions against pimping, against pandering, against brothels, against, you know, sex buying. Like, did you know? Was this your intention? Um, and once they realized, were, you know, completely just aghast and, and you know, just that was not their intention. And truly, they wanted to protect the women. And that was their goal. And, you know, once we kind of pointed out, well, if that was your goal, you know, this bill doesn't have any criminal record relief. This bill has no services. Mm. And if that is if your goal is truly to protect survivors, let's work together on that. And so it does provide an opportunity to actually put survivors at the center and, you know, promote actual legislation that can really invest in services and, you know, record expungement and things that actually help people exit the industry. Because there are so many survivors we've worked with that, you know, really want to put that part of their life behind them and move forward and, you know, and, and, you know, access housing, access jobs, access education, and they can't with those criminal records. Um, And so those are really critical, but, you know, you can't say that these bills are about the women and not have any of that in there. You know, it it becomes very clear that these bills are actually about the industry. And so um, that has been a very, you know, heartening experience to have those conversations and then be able to move forward in a way that actually centers survivors. I think that's amazing. And and you're right. It's just plain and simple. It's in black and white. Who does it actually help? Who is this bill actually supporting? And it's always shocking to me that which politicians will sign on to bills or haven't even read the whole bill or what gets thrown in at the end of a bill at the very last minute, And it gets pushed through the law. I don't think, um, you know, our, our, the raw public understands quite how slippery things can be in, in politics sometimes when it comes to laws and bills. So thank you for mentioning that. We are out of time, Yasmin. I want to thank you so much for coming on here. I'm so glad I finally got you on. Um, and for thank all of our you. listeners, you can go to rightsforgirls.org. For as in the number four, you can read about their work. You can support their work. You can donate. And we will also put things up on our YouTube and our website. So thank you. Thank you. Please join us in this fight. Go to slaveryfreeworld.org and donate. Every amount helps. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you for listening to the Marisol Nichols podcast. And please do not forget to click like and subscribe. And a big shout out to W.D. Hahn for our theme song, Something's Gotta Change. See you next time.